kind of <coughs> color and way. Um, I haven't done many collections in my career, but uh, you know, if uh, you have any questions, feel free to try me anytime time and ask something. And uh, right before the tournament, when I spoke with Simon about uh, taking part in this tournament, he asked me whether I'll be going to give a lecture, and I thought, you know, before it's time to share some stuff that I learned about chess, I decided to And so he asked me like, what kind of lecture I would give. Thinking about it for a while, but I thought, you know, usually we, people give lectures about the best games and um, kind of some opening lines and stuff. And I thought that uh, I'm going to give a lecture about something that I really like in chess, which is the end game. So, uh, and uh, I made a selection of some of my, my favorite end games and my games. Yeah, because so those games I analyzed, I'm not going to go like well known end games that people play because uh, we have enough games in our own selection. And if you guys have like at least 100, 100, 200 games, and if you have some favorite games. So, um, okay, we, where should we start? Okay, the game versus Athens, and what's your kind of game? Okay, I have uh, quite an interesting game from uh, this year's uh, this Russian. Team Chess Championship, and I played against Kraken. And to know him, I think he just won I think, the tournament in Norway today. I'm not sure. So the guy is pretty strong. And um, I'm not going to skip over some part of the game to go quickly into the end game. But if you have questions, you can try. I'm playing black. And so the guy is a theoretician, so I decided to play something, you know, not very, very, very good. I have played this move very much, but it was interesting to see what he's going to do when faced with it. Because, you know, one of the fears in chess is uh, you encounter a well prepared opponent. He's prepared this line for you, and you have no idea how to meet it. And uh, sometimes it goes to a bug, because you can pretend that you know, you're a well prepared line, but instead you can prepare it. So uh, it depends. So in this case, you know, I just have to go for fears. So far, I have a three. Quite simply develops in the center because I allow him to do so. And uh, like I said. So the idea is that if white just continues to develop like something like a castle, then white will be able to play c5, open this bishop, and basically he gets a superior version of Pinoy. So he has to do something here, and e5 is the main move. And c5 still, you know. Otherwise, white just gets the center and the whole advantage, and white pieces are not developed. Okay, but this is all pretty well known. So, bishop e4, rook e8. And now he's sort of uh, uh, thinking for a long time, and then he didn't know what to do, so he played knight e2, which is not the main line, of course. If you want to go to know what the main line is, you have to look it up on the book because I'm not going to go over it right now. But this is a very solid move. The idea is to meet the take the change with the knight. The knight goes to the c6, and at the same time he's prepared to play c3, which is symmetric center. But it gives uh, <coughs> like uh, time to develop. And um, okay, so let's see. So knight h6 is one of those given moves. Sometimes black wants to develop the knight in five. Sometimes he wants to play five or six and put the knight in seven. So this is the flexible move. C3. And now I'm already thinking about uh, how to develop my pieces because it's pretty obvious that he just wants to play bishop on 2 makes a castle, and then develop in the center and just hold the clamp and try to walk my bishop on g7. So it was time to think like where I'm going to put my bishop and the other piece. So I took on d4. Ball takes because the knight takes and just bishop 7 so, and e6, and I thought it was nice move because I'm preparing both the square for a knight and also for the knight to d5. So, he castled, the bishop b3, then knight g4, he has to put the bishop on g1, which is also great. So, he castles, and one more tempo is important. If I put the bishop immediately, then after he capture, I'll have to take with the rook, so I want to take with the queen and put the knight on d5 and control the square. At the same time, there's a small pin, so he has to react on that. H3, the tempo. He, again, it should be 3 and 9, g4, so another tempo, which is good for me. 
far. Just go. You know, getting away from the pin. And that should be set. And at this point, I was satisfied with my game because obviously black is comfortably developed now. And I was starting to think about black for win. So I'll do changes, queen b7. More or less, uh, black has a pretty good position. You know, white has no threats, comfortable game for black. Knight goes to d5, and I'm thinking what can go wrong here. And he just came up with knight g3, which was, took me by surprise because, you know, it makes sense, of course, to change the family place piece with a good one. But, you know, on the other hand, you, he put his king in the open, so to speak, like in the middle of the game. Highly unusual. So, the other the knight goes to d5. Two. Basically, he just wants to develop his rooks connected. <coughs> and now he's surprised with knight g5 again, which was a logical move. But <coughs> the idea is to put the knight here, apply the pressure on the pawn. So, finally, have to take here. And then he may the take with the f pawn with the idea of knight of 6 check, and my king will be vulnerable. So, you know. The guy definitely is good. So, just taking on the 5. And he took with this pawn. Of course, if he takes that pawn, it's some sort of f6. So he plays really safe. Okay, bishop of 5 And we all learned, you know, that you put the pawns on the obvious ball as a square color of your bishop. Bishop d2. And this was important because I had to do something with the bishop. He was closed. And I put him on the nice diagonal where he is much better placed. The knight controls the square, so the bishop goes here. Also, at the same time, king gets moved, and um, he controls all the squares which knight goes to. So I, I thought, you know, again, the game is very close to being even, but I prefer slightly to my position because I thought it's more comfortable. And now he was running short of time, so he's playing all these moves basically standing in one place and I'm trying to get into the superior hand game because my knight on d5 is really strong he's protected by the pawn he cannot exchange except by the knight and then if he does exchange it then his bishop and pawns will be a possible object for attack so basically I'm just trying to exchange all the pieces and try to you know get involved into his uh, side of the board so he doesn't exchange tries to control all the squares. So I have to do something like this and take control of the C line. At the same time, this move um, made uh, the idea that king is under pin and queen is hitting the bottom of the floor. We'll see why it's uh, necessary in a moment. So he basically is just you know, making safe not moves, making everything solid. So now you can see why it is getting a dangerous position because, you know, the king is still in the open, black is um, controlling the only open line, more or less. There are also some possibilities of bishop going here, trying to dislodge this rook, get on the second rank, when the pawn way to his weak. And um, he played rook d1, trying to, you know, change the rook. And now after this move, <laughs> I thought I was close to winning because, you know, he can't, he can't obviously take because I take on a 4 and at the same time his knight has to go because this was a beautiful square for his knight who's controlling all the squares and now he has nowhere to go because if he takes, then the queen takes and it's main threat. So knight f2 and he just wants to play knight d3 after that uh, it's very hard to break his position. So, can you make a guess as to what it can play next? Queen d8. What? Queen d8. Yeah, but he takes the rook. Can rook takes the rook. So, taking d1, queen d8, and, and, and then. Okay, and then now uh, you can just play knight d3, for example. Check and then King just goes to H2 or something. Because once he gets knight on D3, he's completely fine. Okay, let's go to the end game. To the end game because that was amazing. So Bishop H4 check immediately. I was very proud when I saw this because um, 
is forced to take. And item four. So, why do you give up the feeds? Not very clear, but again, the idea is very similar. In the check, in G5 check, and also in D4. So, point F3, check, in here, rotate on D1. So, he has to take the queen because the knight takes and queen takes bishop and takes the knight. So, he has to take the queen and queen D4. <coughs> And if he takes the queen, which he did, there is a check. King of three and ninety four check. So basically, because of that little combination, like the other one. And this moment, at this moment, I thought I was easily winning. And I started to play really fast. Ninety three. And, um, okay, so a5 was still, yeah. So I played a5, tried to get the weakness out of there from my c5, possible break. And then a4, and then you, even though I have an extra pawn, it's not so easy because if I take an a4, then it's very hard to do something against this plan of king moving just up to the queen side. So instead I played b4 and tried to, you know, Locate this position and try to see whether I can improve. But it's not so easy. So, how does the black can improve his position? If he is allowed, he will just push his pawn to h6, g5, then some king goes uh, here, and possibly, ah, the king should go to b6, ideally, then 95 check or something, and at the same time to push the pawns and try to get the 90 square. <coughs> square. Ideally, that would be the square where he covers the pawn, and he also attacks the pawn here, so c5 is a critical square. So if black somehow can get the king to b6, and knight to d7 to c5, and hold the position here with the pawn majority, then he'll be fine. But what happens is he just plays king f4 and h4. So how does the black improve his position? It's very difficult because um, if knight goes, the knight goes to c5 immediately. And I don't have any way to break g5. And white can also try to, you know, simply attack the pawn. And where, how can I improve at all? It's not clear. So I thought for a long time. And obviously in the end game, the first thing to do is still have to bring your king into the center. That's rule number one. That's the strongest piece in the world. So you have to put it as close to the center as possible, so king of seven has to go. So he's just standing on the same place, he's waiting for me to make progress. And now he plays knight b7. He ties up my knight in defense of the pawn. So basically, and I cannot play g5 because uh, he's covered here. So the only piece I can play is, with, is my king. And then I remembered that, you know, the knight endgames is very similar to the uh, pawn endgames. So sometimes it's important to lose the tempo. And how do you lose it? By triangulation. So in this position, I played king f8. <coughs> he went back to c5. King of 7 Knight e7. And king to e7. So we achieved the triangulation. White has to move his knight. And the pawn is protected on e6. So now I can play knight to d8. And the idea is, I want to put the knight somewhere where he promotes the movement of my pawns to make it majority, at the same time to hit the pawn on e5. So the knight goes to f7, so I can play g5. So if he, if he allows me to play knight f7 and g5, then he loses the pawn on e5. And even if he goes and takes the pawn on a5, my knight on e5 covers the squares c6 and c4. So that means my king only has to go and grab the knight. Because uh, then uh, the pawn here and pawn here, um, it's like, you know, he can't uh, control both pawns. While my king will be able to control his A and C pawns. So he, he understands that and he plays g4, that's his only chance. So he doesn't let me play g5. So if I play knight f7, he can play g5 himself. And I can make no progress because king is too well placed on f4. 
So I have to take in G4. And try to create again the majority on the king side. So king f4, check, take, take, and king e4. If he goes king g4, then I can take on e5.
So here he thought for, for some time, then he realized he has to play 94 check and try to move the pawn with my with his knight. So king goes forward, attack, check, king forward, knight one, g4. Basically, this is forced. King takes a5, and in this position, there is only one way black can win. Unfortunately, I didn't see it. So the game resulted in a, in a draw, but, you know, I'm just curious. What do you guys think? No computers. No. No cheating. The knight hinders this pawn. So what if you play like knight c4, knight c2? Is that that knight Yeah, that's what I did. Very similar idea. So the one of the ideas is I just pointed out. Congratulations on the US Championship. So um, is to simply um, try to get this knight away from the pawn. Because the knight goes somewhere to d2, h2, g3, and he cannot uh, catch it because he is on the square. So the only way to do it is to put the knight on d2 square, give the knight c4 check or knight f3, which I did in the game. However, that is too slow because white makes a draw um, by just by one move. So yeah. similar to what happened in the game. 93 doesn't help because um, his a pawn is too fast. King f3. King f3. Um, G3. <coughs> well, there is no issue to check, but also what about king b5, king f2, a5, take on f1, a6, uh, g3. A7, G2, check here, and then mm, okay. But King F3, if I play King B5, King F2, right? He can also play Knight 2 here. Knight F3, King E2. Um, king E2, Knight E4. So it's a it's a dance. Remember, the knight goes dancing around this ball. Knight C6. Right here, Knight C6. Okay, so knight is 6 and I just play king d6, I don't know. G3. G3. Um, I take a check. Oh, again, knight is 6 here. One, uh, one of the good training things tools for you guys is, you know, try to see the board without moving the pieces so you can see it and still analyze it. So, knight is 6 okay, king d6.
trying to quit it, and then suddenly the only way to win it is if you push this little guy. That's pretty amazing. And what happened in the game, I played the same idea as I was having this chest of damn free. It took 92. Deflection of the night. Because he takes, he is just not in time. But there is sort of a miracle in this position because I took the knight. A6. And here I played knight e3 to try to catch the pawn because if I play g3, a7. Give a check here, and he goes with the king. I take the queen, and it seems like you know I should be faster, but it's still not the case. So I used the queen was ready in the mirror. I played king e5. You know, to try to catch the pawn was my king. You know, and put my pawn there, but nothing works because he's just in time. You probably all remember when I was a kid, you know, there was the same study. Like, uh, do you remember the study? It's the same yeah, study. Yeah, because if here, then here, and if I take the pawn, he grabs this pawn, you know, my pawn, he moves the pawn. So basically, there was the same study where something like the king is here. The pawn's like at age six, right? Or yeah, age yeah. six. And the idea is, while, well, like, for example, the king is somewhere here. Seven. Right? On this side? Well, C6 is not Okay, so you all know the study, yeah. right? So basically, the king goes attacking the pawn, and then he just goes to the queen side and draws. Anyway, so this was a titanic battle which lasted like for seven hours. Okay, six hours was the current speed of time control. But I thought it was a really good game because it shows you the night hand game that one mistake can ruin your whole your play game. Okay, so there we go with that one. I'm going to show you something that um, I really like. It was very unusual. Okay, so this was actually the game played in uh, 2012. It was the ACP Chess Professionals First Classic event, which was run by my friend Dino Sotovsky. And I played uh, with Black against uh, Chewbacca. You guys probably know him. He's a famous Georgian player, very attacking player, very original. And he used to play b3 in the first move and beat many strong answers. Okay, but in this game, he played something more solid against me. And at this point, we're playing Italian game. And I'm thinking, okay, this is going to be a really fast draw, a very boring draw. And suddenly, 
he came up with D4, because usual move is D3. So D4. Okay, and then I remember that I had a very short uh, draw with black against uh, a <coughs> Romanian player, where he took on D4, bishop B4 check, bishop D2, D5, it's a very famous draw. And then Chukalo came up with E5. Okay, it's all well known. And now everybody plays bishop D5. But this guy, he played bishop E2. So, we reached a very unusual position right after, what, six moves? Eight moves? And then also we started thinking. It was interesting. And um, White's main idea is to dislodge this knight, protect the pawn square, and prove that my bishop on d6 is outsider. And I want to prove that my knight on d4 is good, and somehow to break his pawn center. Basically, that's the theme of this game. So, we follow like this. Bishop g4, hitting the pawn. Bishop d3. F5, trying to protect the knight, and um, also have ideas some kind of f4, and so I can take the pawn on d4. So he takes, I take with the queen. I'm very happy here because I have a very active position. All I have to do is just basically castle somewhere, and you know start hitting his pawn on d4. So nice hit three. No time yet because it's hanging. So I'm thinking for a while, and then I. And I said, why not play something interesting and castle long side? You know, so because I was still hitting the spawn on d4. But he attacks my bishop now with check, so I have no time to take on f3. So, king b8 takes. And now this is getting really double-edged because uh, my king is vulnerable to all the pawn ball movements. I still have my trump, like, you know, um, Trying to get this guy, take on a 3, 9 g5, 9 g6, and hit this ball. So, that's what he did. So he started it again. A4. And I took. And played rook e8, centralizing the pieces. Again, one of the rules in chess, you know, you should simply develop all your pieces, try to put them in the center, and uh, see what happens. Right now, this knight is protecting all the squares. Well, he just sacrificed the pawn anyway. So if I take it, he goes a5 and opens my king, which I didn't want to do. So I came up with this plan, 96. I want him actually to take the pawn. So that I can bring my rooks finally to the game and take this pawn, attack the bishop, and I felt very comfortable here. So he plays a5. And obviously you have to walk, so b5, and queen c1. So, basically now he's hitting the knight, he wants to play a6 and, uh, you know, open my king. At the same time he created a threat of bishop g5, giving the change. So what to do here? And I decided, okay, why not? So we go to this position, knight c4, beautiful knight, protecting this, now no more attack white, but he gets an exchange. So, 24. Takes. Takes. A6. Which is normal, you know, trying to open the position. And now instead of B6, I decided to take on B4. And we reached this unusual position where. <coughs> It seems that my king is open, but look at this pawn structure. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, these knights, they take away all the squares. They're all protected. And what's going on? No idea. But I like that. You know, the visual is very, very pleasing. So, so he decided to play with rooks and chase my queen around a little bit. Because if he wants to make any progress, he has to use this open line and try to get in there somehow, but except that how he can do it, because all the squares they are taking the knights. If he doubles the rooks and somehow penetrates, uh, then he is much better, but um, again, the question is how. At the same time, how do I improve my position? Also the question. So he plays rook b3, takes away the knight uh, square, 
and we're planning to move the bishop somewhere so he can move the right one rook on f3 and penetrate again. So king b6, you know, when it's out, king goes and was uh, extremely I, I thought it was good because the knight also is now available to go to d4. If he gets to d4, then these knights have a really powerful. So what happens? He plays bishop t1. Again, he wants to squish the rook, put the bishop somewhere on b3, and to control the ball movement and try to break in there. Okay. So rook d6. The idea is if you place rook f3, then I try to exchange the points. Obviously, with the pawns like this in the end game, any end game is good for black, even down the exchange. So I want to exchange the queens. Bishop c2, sort of like okay, attack, I defend. Rook e8. Now things are uh, getting really interesting by the time control because you know we're running again short on time. Rook e6, and I thought that was a very ordinary move, you know, trying to take over the line and uh, get rid of his active rook. And what happened is that uh, he attacked here. And a very interesting opportunity presented itself to me, which I couldn't uh, ignore. And I just decided to give up the queen. <coughs> and we have this position. So, I have rook and knight, and uh, basically two pawns, but the one is gone. So that means rook and knight versus queen, mathematical. But we have here very strong pawns, he has no attack. <laughs> and I thought I was completely winning here. So, what happened is that in time trouble we made some mistakes. I decided to play, say, rook d8. And it turns out this was a mistake because I should have played rook here, then pawn push and rook and swing. But I decided to play safe and, you know, the chess cannon says that the rook should be behind the pawn to support its movement. So he took an h6. And now I realized that, um, you know, this pawn is not really any pawn anywhere, anywhere because the bishop uh, just simply blocks it. So I decided to play 95 and d4 and give up this pawn as well. So he took it. He said thank you. And uh, my e, c6. So what I have here is a different picture now. Black has three pawns here, and black has three pawns here. So the question is uh, which pawn is going to win first? So h4, and I decided to push all of them together. Because if you push this pawn immediately, after bishop g4, it turns out that this queen is really placed here because he not only pins my one knight, he also controls this line, so this pawn will have the problems moving to c3. And at the same time, he is almost ready there to sack a queen and make another queen. So you have to be real careful here. So c4, h5, c3, h6, d2. <coughs> which was this passer. And now faced with his own strong passer. So okay, rook g7 has to be played. And now I hope this, this pawn will be fast enough to counter this pawn. And he plays g4, and he's showing that if he, his pawn gets to g6, and he's completely made up. So now what do you do? Because I cannot play c3, and if I play a d5, then I'll be placed with either queen and five by h7. And his queen is also, you know, um, preventing my pawns from queening. And uh, I was very proud of my next maneuver. Can you guess what it is? Ninety five. No, not ninety five, but just my ninety five is not that great. Surprisingly we played almost on the first and second line. Lines. It's incredible. This is very hard to get. Okay, I'm going to show it because we don't have much time. So, I played 93 and 95. The idea is that knights 
are well connected, and they create a lot of tactics here based on all this, you know, forks and stuff. There's also is also, you know, cutting off the device can control over this bomb, uh -huh. so the bomb can now move. That also creates checks. And he also, in case G6, you know, he can, I can always give him up to disrupt his connected passers and start with my own passers. So this was an extremely strong maneuver. And now he made a mistake. He played queen at four because, you know, uh, he's very creative guy, he, and he thought there was no difference between playing queen at five or queen at four because he C3 and just check. You know, and um, no idea. But 25 was a draw, actually. So, but uh, like many big lines here, but 24 is a mistake because, again, the important thing to learn from this game is that you have to have connected passers. Just don't push the phone by itself. They all go together much quicker. So he now realized he's in trouble and he's trying to use my king's open position to give some checks and to break. <coughs> This. So C3, and now he is trying to, you know, get rid of my major piece. I don't know, I don't know B5, because the knight goes, and this whole thing goes immediately. And um, I can have a guess, what did I play here? Rook D2. Rook D5. What? Rook D5? Rook D2. Okay, so Rook D2, yeah. So it's good. King G3, obviously. C2. C2 Very good. C2. Yeah. Don't care about this line because check and rook goes C3, right? And Queen only has one check, King C7, no more checks, and Queen goes here. H7. H7, right. Very good. So, this is fourth, right? So rook D3. C3. And um, again, he gives me a check because he takes, takes, queen, queen, takes, queen takes, queen takes, queen takes, queen takes, queen So, queen b5 check, king c7, and queen f1 is saying that he wants to exchange the queen for that pawn so he can queen another queen. Anyway, I took him up with his offer. So this is the queen, take, c1, take, take, take queen, and b3, we have another one. Because if he takes b2 and there is uh, no stopping my queen. So check, 97, and he wants to push his own. <laughs> But unfortunately, you know, after b2, g7, I don't play b1 because he takes and wins the draw. And after 97, he resigned because you know, my knight is stopping his queen, my queen is queen. So as you can see, all these three pawns, they all win. <laughs> and his pawns almost all win too. That was kind of funny, it was a good position. Yeah. Why couldn't you take the rook in the beginning when the queen threatened the rook on c1? Why did the queen take? Or how are you able to do that without taking the rook? Um, when his rook was present, to where? You went rook c1, the queen was on c3, but she didn't take. Oh. Okay, I'll see. So, where's the queen? Here? Yeah. Pawn on c2, rook on c3. Yeah. <coughs> Something like this? Yeah, I think, I think the rook was on c3, the pawn. Yeah. Okay, give me a second. Um, Yeah, but the rook's in front on the C file. No, I think it's a little past this. Okay. Um, well, well, he played H7. H7. And then check. Check and then RC3. Oh. Right here, yeah. Did he take the stroke? You mean? No. Because the pawn. Yeah, the pawn takes. Oh, no, I thought the pawn wasn't there. Okay, oh, never mind. Zero. Never mind. Okay. Well, <laughs> <that's the next laughs> earlier, earlier in the game, yeah. Couldn't you have taken, with, when you sacrificed the queen, couldn't you have taken the rook on f3 first and yeah. then gotten both rooks? Yeah, yeah no, but it was pretty stuff, you know. I just wanted to <laughs> rush to create something unusual. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we made a lot of mistakes in this game, both of us. But, you know, it was 
very unusual position. You don't get many middle game positions where you have both knights here. You're down in change and your king is wide open. <laughs> so it's, it's covered like, like nothing happens. So that was one of the games that um, was very unusual in game. I consider this an end game. It's not actually a new game, even though you have queen, but it's an end game. So um, I don't know what time is it right now. 420. Yeah, how long did I have? I would imagine another 10 minutes. The next round starts yeah, at 5, minutes, right? Yeah, I won't be able to go over the game uh, in 10 minutes. So, Q&A, anyway? Yeah, uh, you mentioned it's good to visualize the board without moving the pieces. Yeah. Do you have any uh, advice for exercise, for practice to improve that? Well, um, I mean, when I was young, yep. my dad, he gave me the study book to go to high school. And so I was supposed to solve the problems you know, just by looking at the board, I had no access to the chess board, and I had like 10, 15 minutes between the classes, so I had to, and I had to solve three positions a day. Obviously, you know, I, I would look here and there, and I, and I said I solved this, and I looked up the answer sometimes, but it was a good, it was a good practice because uh, you really get in the mood, you want to kill the position, you want to solve it honestly, and uh, you have to visualize without moving the pieces, and that was a good uh, practice for you, because uh, it's not so easy sometimes, but that's what happens in the game. You can move the piece, right? And if you push the piece, it's like, you know, you're getting used to it, you develop a really bad habit. You know, you're supposed to develop good habits.